Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and I would like to welcome you to the 15th lecture of the summer 2020 offering of EC3084 Signals and Systems. In the last couple of lectures, we have reviewed the idea of Fourier series. This allowed us to take a periodic function and write it as a sum of weighted complex sinusoids, where a mega naught was the fundamental frequency of the periodic signal. We are able to find the Fourier series coefficients using the Fourier series analysis integral, in which we could evaluate over any period the function we wanted to analyze times e to the minus j omega naught kt dt. So this is all well and good, but the trouble with Fourier series is that it only applies to periodic functions. Today we're going to look at the Fourier transform. So the Fourier transform will allow us to write a function as a weighted sum of sinusoids. This function doesn't need to be periodic anymore, but the resulting sum is a bit more complicated. Instead of a discrete countable sum, we now have an uncountably infinite sum indicated by this integral. Instead of having Fourier series coefficients that are functions of an integer k, we'll have a function of a continuous variable omega. I'll talk about the j a little bit later. That's just a convention. Here times e to the j. Now instead of summing over a discrete set of frequencies that are integer multiples of some fundamental frequency, we'll be integrating over a continuum of frequencies indicated by omega. So how do we find these sort of new, weird Fourier series coefficient-like things, but they're not really Fourier series coefficients anymore. So this here is called the inverse continuous time Fourier transform. So what sort of magic do I need to do to find this thing here, this weird thing that's like a set of Fourier series coefficients, but instead of being a function of an integer, it's a function of a continuum of omega where these things are found by this mysterious thing called the continuous time Fourier transform. And my giant X here is actually the Fourier transform. So here, this is kind of like the Fourier series analysis integral. We don't have the one over T naught sitting out in front, but we are integrating over the function, except now we're integrating over the entire function instead of just a period. But we still have an E to the J omega sort of thing, but this is now a continuum. Things aren't locked. So write e to the minus j omega t dt. Now most descriptions of Fourier transforms will start by telling you about the continuous time Fourier transform, and they'll say that this is magical and they'll give you the inverse continuous time Fourier transform. But if you think about it, this is the really the big most amazing concept. The fact that you can take a lot of functions, even ones that are not periodic, and write them as a sum of sinusoids. Here are complex sinusoids. That's pretty amazing. And within that context, the continuous time Fourier transform is sort of secondary. It's just kind of a trick that lets us find what these weights big X of J omega need to be. The big X of J omega, this is a conventional notation that we use in 3084. A lot of other textbooks will use it. Don't think of this J as being terribly important. It's just a notational convenience. It's similar to the notation of e to the J omega hat that we used in 2026 to describe the discrete time Fourier transform. You should really think of the DTFT as being a function of omega hat. And with the continuous time Fourier transform, you should think of it as being a function of a real variable omega. And this other business here is just a notational convenience to remind us of what we're doing. Later in the class, when we look at Laplace transforms, we'll see that if you take a Laplace transform that is a function of a complex variable s and evaluate at j omega, you get the Fourier transform. If this Fourier transform exists, and if the imaginary axis here is within the region of convergence of the Laplace transform, that's a whole other story we'll cover later in the course. Just as in 2026, we saw that if you took the z transform, and plugged in e to the j mega hat, you'll get the discrete time Fourier transform, again with those caveats about region of convergence, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you are taking EC 2026 and somebody says Fourier transform, they would usually mean discrete time Fourier transform. 
But in both 3084 and pretty much the rest of the universe, if somebody says Fourier transform and doesn't put a qualifier on it, they mean the continuous time Fourier transform. And they'll say something like discrete time or DT if they need to indicate otherwise. All right, so let's do an example. We're going to take the Fourier transform of a decaying exponential function. So we'll write this as x of t is equal to e to the minus a t u t. It's important to note here that this derivation only makes any sense for a bigger than zero. Not every function has a Fourier transform, especially the folks over in the math department can cook up all sorts of weird devious functions that don't have Fourier transforms. Fortunately, many of the functions that are of interest in engineering do have Fourier transforms, but something that's blowing up to infinity doesn't have a Fourier transform. A little bit later in the course, we'll use Laplace transforms as a way of analyzing those kinds of functions. So let's plug our function into our Fourier transform formula. Okay, so let's actually compute this integral. We're going to integrate from minus infinity to infinity of our function, which is e to the minus a t u t times e to the minus j omega t dt. And I'm only writing this out because this may be the first time you've seen someone take a Fourier transform. Usually I would very quickly notice that this u t here only turns on for t bigger than zero. So I can chop the lower limit of the integral at zero. And then I could rewrite this whole mess in here. I'll have e to the minus a plus j omega this whole thing in the parentheses times t, dt. And now we can do some calculus. And now we can write e to the minus a plus j omega t all over a plus j omega with the minus sign here. If you imagine taking the derivative with respect to t, the stuff here in the exponent will come down and cancel with the stuff in the denominator. Evaluated at our limits of t going from zero to infinity. Okay, so how should we write this? I'm gonna suppose that we're going to take this minus sign here and pull it through so I can swap the order of what I'm plugging in for t. So everything here is gonna have an a plus j omega down here in the denominator. And so for the numerator, because I swapped the order, I can plug in t equals zero first. So e to the zero is one. So that's gonna give me one. And now what's going on with this expression at infinity? Let me think about that over to the side here. If I split this up, I'll have an e to the minus a t times an e to the minus j omega t. So this is where the fact that we had this a is bigger than zero requirement, this is where that becomes important. Because what that means is that this function here this is going to go to zero as t goes to infinity. So this is going to decay. What about my function here? Well, this is a complex sinusoid. It's going to have a real part that's a cosine. It's going to have an imaginary part that's a sine. But either way, these are functions that are wiggling back and forth between minus one and one. So that's fine because we have this decaying exponential here. We have a decaying complex sinusoid. As t goes to infinity, that associated term goes to zero. So we've actually finished figuring out what the Fourier transform is. It's one over a plus j omega. So we've computed the first of what's going to be a long line of Fourier transforms. We'll say that e to the minus a t u t Fourier transforms into one over a plus j omega. And again, this will have the caveat of for a bigger than zero. This won't work for a equals zero. There sort of is a Fourier transform of the unit step function, but it is a deeply weird thing that is kind of dangerous to use. So I actually don't like to show it in students in 3084 because it has a lot of weird complexities associated with it. I'm going to use the bad color to indicate this. You can't plug in zero here. You can't just say, oh, well, I'll plug in zero for a and say that the Fourier transform of the unit step function is one over j omega. This does not work. Okay, so let's call the Fourier transform we're studying here for the moment big X of j omega. This is a complex valued function, so it's gonna have a magnitude and phase, and let's see what those look like. So if I wanna find out what the magnitude looks like, the easiest thing is actually to take the magnitude squared because then I could rewrite it as the function 
times the complex conjugate of the function. Here I've got 1 over a plus j omega. And complex conjugates are really great. They commute over almost anything. So the complex conjugate of x here is 1 over a minus j omega. And now you see why that's a useful thing. If I multiply the denominators together, I'll wind up with an a squared. Let's see, j times j gives me a minus, which cancels with this minus, which gives me a plus. So that gives me a plus omega squared, and then the cross terms cancel. Let me rewrite this slightly. Let me just write it as omega squared plus a squared, since that's usually the way that you'll see it. All right, so we figured out that the magnitude of big X of j omega is equal to the square root of 1 over omega squared plus a squared. If you want to plot this, it winds up looking something like this. Imagine that's symmetric. This is called a Lorentz function. You might look at this and say, oh, that looks like a Gaussian function, as you might see in probability theory. So that would be like e to the minus something times omega squared. But that's not really this. It is something different, although it does have that vague overall bell shape. Whoops, I should have closed out the absolute value operation here. Anyway, if you're interested in the angle of this Fourier transform, it has this arctangent kind of shape, but I won't get into that further here. One more thing. If you are not taking ECE 3084 with me in the summer 2020 semester, you should feel free to check out now. But if you are taking EC3084 with me in the summer 2020 semester, I would like you to do the following to make sure you've watched this video. I would like you to go to Piazza, and there you will find a post entitled something like Lecture 15 Task. And here I would like two things. I would like you to take the second letter of your last name and turn it into a number in the usual way, a to 1, z to 26, and you don't have to do anything else to it. I think that's sufficiently strange to disguise what I'm asking and make sure somebody's actually seen this video. So don't tell your friends about this. This is just between you and me. Don't post this highly secure and impossible to guess formula on your Piazza post. Second thing I want to know is, do you play a musical instrument or instruments? And if so, which one or ones if you play multiple? Okay, that's it.